Hello and welcome to the interview. I'm Armand Georgian in Paris. Continuing business as usual would mean that our civilization moves inexorably towards collapse. That's the stark warning made by my guest in a recent research paper that was published by the UN's Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. The United Nations is increasingly aware of global collapse scenarios in part thanks to scientists such as Tom Chernev, who puts his background in mechanical engineering and theoretical physics to maximum use at Cambridge University's Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. And he joins me from Adelaide in Australia. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for being my guest on the interview here. Uh, tell us first, what is global collapse exactly? Hi, Armin. Thank you very much for having me on today. Um, it's great to speak to you and talk about this topic. So, context of climate change, which is what the paper for the United Nations was, um, societal or global collapse, it would be that we can't carry on with business as usual, that we haven't acted quickly enough to mitigate the effects of climate change, and we haven't taken action to ensure that we have a secure future. Now, this is looking at things like agriculture, uh, industry, just about everything that's impacted by climate change. So when we're talking about, uh, when I talk about in the paper about um, how we could face very uncertain futures in terms of collapse, it's very much as a result of inaction um, mm. for the warnings that we already have that are very clear. We'll, we'll talk about inaction and action a little bit later, but I'm just interested to, to follow up on one thing. Global collapse, the emphasis then is on global. In other words, all societies are equally affected by a complete breakdown or does it still is, are there still differences according to whether we're talking about France or you know, Southern Africa, for example? I think it very much depends, and that's a really good question. Um, so climate change, it's a global problem, and it's going to impact different regions of the world differently at mm. quicker and slower rates, and we're going to see the impacts worse or not so bad, depending on where you are. So I think, um, I think it's likely or it's possible, certainly, that if we, if we don't take good action on climate change, mm. then... At some level, we're going to be having very serious effects, no matter where we are in the mm. world. Um, and of course, some places are going to have it worse than others. But ultimately, we'll be seeing the effects everywhere. Uh, you, you work with this concept of planetary boundaries and how breaching one of them essentially leads to, to breaching of another planetary boundary, if I, if I understand that correctly. Just give us a, a quick sort of rundown of what that is. Of course. And for everyone listening at home, I encourage you, there's a documentary that came out recently with Rockstrom, um, who's a researcher who developed with his colleagues the concept of planetary boundaries. And so David Attenborough. And in this, they really give a good description of what they are. But essentially, Earth is incredibly complex. And the system of it, how every piece interacts with the others, is very complex. But the planetary boundaries, what it aims to do is distill this into nine different systems. So there's a climate system, there's a biodiversity system, there's stratospheric ozone, and there's nine of these that some of his researchers um, used to define Earth systems. And by looking at these and understanding where we are within these planetary boundaries, we can have a good idea or we can start to talk about potentially where the future could be taking us. So, so you've argued for incorporating planet, th this idea of planetary boundaries into the next uh, 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 SDGs or uh, Sustainable Development Goals that the UN has set out. Uh, is that because the UN has sort of more or less ignored the breaching of planetary boundaries? I mean, what's, what's happening with that exactly? No, absolutely not. I think uh, the UN and uh, the whole Sustainable Development Goals have done a fantastic job at both raising awareness and mobilizing action uh, to increase sustainability and mitigate the worst effects of climate change. But I think the advantages of the planetary boundaries framework is that it's very concise and neat. There's nine systems that it looks at, and it's very clear in saying that they interact with one another, and if we can focus resources on some of them, then it's likely we'll have positive effects on the other ones. 
-hmm. So for example, um, the planetary boundaries, if these could be incorporated post 2030 in mm -hmm. whatever next sustainable development goals emerge, it would give those goals a very climate change sustainability uh, focus, which is what we need going forward. Your paper, the one I mentioned in the introduction, which talks about which was used by the UN's office uh, for disaster risk uh, reduction, uh, you, you have basically four pathways for the world. This is you've modelled four pathways, and only one of them avoids collapse. Uh, it's called stable Earth. Uh, so things are not looking very good. I suppose one could say. I think you. You could definitely say that. Um, I'm an optimist. I think humanity absolutely has what it takes to to really increase our action and mitigate the worst effects of climate change. But having said that, we do really need to do more and do it soon. Um, so there's been talk that the 2020s are very much the decade where we need to we need to make as much progress towards cutting emissions and improving sustainability worldwide as possible. Um, like I said before, because these Earth systems are so complex, there is there's the possibility that, well, we absolutely don't understand how they all interact. Mm -hmm. And so it's really in our best interest to act as quickly as we can now so that we don't have any more surprises further well, down the track. Th that's the thing. They're really complex, and it's hard to know when some of these boundaries have actually been transgressed. So in a sense, it it then becomes too late to do something if one realizes a few late years later, oh, that transgression happened and that other transgression happened. That's something you talk about in your research, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely it is. Because these boundaries interact with one, on one another um, and we don't completely understand how they do interact. Mm. Um, it's really a risky game that we're playing by not putting more action towards mitigating climate change at the moment. Yeah. Now, uh, Having said that, um, there's uh, of the nine boundaries, one of those, uh, the stratospheric ozone one, um, that was one that we were actually able to bring back with very effective political action, where the world realized that it was in our best interest to act on this, that the ozone layer was in trouble, and we were able to have worldwide political action that's brought that back into a safe operating space, so to speak, for that planetary boundary. Uh just on the future of international cooperation on the these boundary planetary boundaries uh, do you think that i'm just curious whether you think uh, in the the global response to covid-19 does that make you optimistic about the possibilities of global cooperation or is covid essentially a much simpler thing to manage even though it obviously isn't easy but it's a lot more simple than uh, than climate mitigation so it's it's definitely not simple, um, absolutely not. And the optimism that we that we can um, all come together and act on it. I think, uh, firstly, just I'd like to highlight that for a number of years before COVID, there were uh, organisations around the world and scientists warning that a pandemic was likely to happen, and then it happened. And we're in a similar spot now, where there's so much talk about how we have to do more to mitigate climate action, uh, climate change, sorry, because mm. we're not doing enough. So I see a bit of a parallel there. But going forward, I think taking from COVID, it's something that we've all been able to come together and work towards solving. And that absolutely makes me optimistic for climate change. Um, I think we need to have politicians, industry, academia, they're all coming together but we need to bring them together more and have more action happening sooner and quicker. Do you think, though, realistically, Tom, uh, what will actually push people to change is being impacted by disasters uh, such as these heat waves that we now see uh, every summer, that only that will ultimately make people change the way they do things? Absolutely. I think that's, I think that's part of it. Um, being, you know, having the experience of climate change impacting your day-to-day -day life is going to make you want to take more action for it. Um, but I think education as well is incredibly important. Mm. Uh, we need, we already are teaching this in schools, uh, getting the next generations um, to be 
scientifically literate, wanting to make positive change. So I think education is probably the most important thing uh, that we can be doing right now. And as well as that, it comes down to the everyday person as well. If we can all put pressure on pretty much the world to take more action, then um, hopefully politicians, industry, everyone will start to listen and take more and more action. And that's something that we've been seeing recently where um, the the uptick in sustainability in corporations has been extremely uh, encouraging. Well, that's a very interesting point, of course, whether one has access to that kind of education to be scientifically literate is a bit of a lottery in life in a way, isn't it? Um, But it's a very important point. Uh, Thank you so much to my guest, uh, Tom Chernev from the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at Cambridge University, joining me from Adelaide in Australia. Thanks for watching the interview here on France 24. 